Despite the fact that an excellent vaccine is available against yellow fever virus, there's been a recent resurgence of yellow fever disease in Angola and other African countries that's proved difficult to control. An emergency committee convened by the World Health Organization has declared the epidemic a serious health concern. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Alan Barrett, Director of the Seeley Center for Vaccine Development and Professor in the Departments of Pathology and of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Texas Medical Branch. Dr. Barrett has written a perspective article on the current yellow fever epidemic and the problem of vaccine supply and demand. Dr. Barrett, just to set the stage, can you describe for us the usual symptoms and common complications of yellow fever disease? How serious is it? It's a very serious disease. But to put it into perspective, it's a typical arbovirus infectious disease. 80% of the people who get infected don't have any clinical signs of disease. They get infected and they seroconvert and they're protected. About 20% will go on to get a febrile illness, which will be like flu-like symptoms and then progress. If it progresses further, it's a biphasic illness. Once you get past the febrile illness, you then get a very severe disease, hemorrhagic fever. And that's due to the fact that the virus targets the liver. By targeting the liver, you get liver dysfunction, the person turns yellow, you have hemorrhagic fever, and the people, uh, unfortunately, have uh, blood loss from many different orifices. It's a very horrible disease to get. Ultimately, if you lead to this severe disease, probably 30% of people will die. Not a very pleasant disease to get. You mentioned in your article that at least a portion of the current epidemic involves an urban rather than a forest transmission cycle. Are urban outbreaks more likely to spread, or are they more difficult to control? Yes, urban outbreaks are much harder to control because the cycle involves mosquitoes biting humans. The humans become viremic, the mosquitoes feed on them, and then it goes to another human. And so it becomes a very hard to control disease because we are the major host, just as with dengue. In the jungle cycle, of course, the normal cycle is between mosquitoes and non-human primates when only humans are incidental hosts, when they go near the monkeys and mosquitoes. So the urban yellow fever is very worrying, it's hard to control, and needs a lot of vaccine to control it. Another worry that you mention is the importation of a number of cases to China, since yellow fever hasn't previously been found in Asia, and since international regulations should have required Chinese travelers to provide evidence of immunization. What do we know about how well that kind of regulation works? Yes, that's a very difficult problem. As you indicate, we have these regulations that require yellow fever immunization to be shown if you're moving from a yellow fever endemic area to another one. And indeed, people returning from Angola to go to China should have had to show a yellow fever certificate and they don't. And it's one of the problems of regulations. How do you enforce them? And some countries are very good at enforcing them. An example would be Brazil. Other countries, unfortunately, are not so good at enforcing the rules. It is a difficult scenario. And I think that's one we in society have to cope with. We have regulations, but how do we enforce them? And that's not straightforward. Looking at the vaccine, the yellow fever vaccine is what you call a legacy vaccine produced in embryonated chicken eggs. When was it developed? And is there work being done on a more modern version of it? Yes. Yeah, so the vaccine was developed in the 1930s. It was developed by a man called Max Tyler, who won the Nobel Prize in 1951. In fact, this is the only Nobel Prize ever been won for developing a vaccine, surprisingly. And Tyler took a wild-type strain of CB and passaged it in chicken tissue to adapt it and made this live vaccine, 17D. It went through one clinical trial involving about 30 people. It was so successful that it was licensed in 1937-38. The vaccine initially was proved very successful, and so it was given out to many different places. The live vaccine was taken in different countries, used differently, and then there were problems found with the vaccine of it being overpassaged. It became attenuated, and instances of where human serum was used to stabilize the vaccine, and unfortunately that human serum was contaminated with hepatitis B, and there were a number of American soldiers who got hepatitis from receiving yellow fever vaccine. And so in 1945, rules were developed for how the vaccine should be manufactured and how it should have a seed lock system. That is to say, the vaccine exists as a seed, you passage it once to make your vaccine lot, and then you go back to that same seed again to make the next lot, so you can control how it's made. And I said that was done in 1945 under the approval of the United Nations. And since then, the vaccine has not changed very much in the last 70 plus years. And as I said, that's why I've called it a legacy vaccine. It's works great over the years, so why change it? But of course, that doesn't really help us in the 21st century. We need to do better at making vaccines. And the question is, how do we do it? Unfortunately, the vaccine is very cheap. It's about a dollar a dose. And so there is not much hope of industry trying to improve the vaccine because there's not much money in it. 
And the question comes, how do we improve the vaccine? And that's really a very difficult question to answer at this time because it would cost a lot of money to improve the vaccine. How do we do it? Probably the one way in which we can improve the vaccine is to produce it in um, the continuous cells rather than emanated chicken eggs, such as monkey kidney vera cells. That monkey kidney vera cell approach is currently used by the manufacturer of Sanofi Pasteur for their dengue vaccine and their Japanese encephalitis vaccine. And so there is precedent of making live vaccines on vera cells, and it's possible we could make a yellow fever vaccine also on vera cells. So the vaccine, improved or not, is effective, but the other issue is supply, and the supply is not adequate to the demand. What are the factors that limit the supply? Well, the first one, of course, is eggs. You need specific pathogen-free eggs, and of course, the manufacturing facilities used to make yellow fever are often used to make flu vaccine in eggs as well. And so we have a limited supply of eggs. You can only get so many doses of vaccine out of an egg, and so we have limitations in what we can do. Compounded with that, we only have six producers of vaccine around the world. As I said earlier, unfortunately, there's not much money in making yellow fever vaccine, and so it's hard to encourage manufacturers to go into it. We currently have the six, as I said, four or what we call pre-qualified, which means their vaccines have been shown to meet a high standard by the WHO, and so the United Nations make them pre-qualified so that countries know how much it's going to cost and the quality of the vaccine. The two other vaccines made are made by Sanofi Pasteur, United States and a vaccine in China. And those two are made for the domestic market only and neither have tried to become pre-qualified. So we now have four suppliers around the world. And of course, having four suppliers makes it very difficult. One of the four decided to renovate their facilities recently. And so they came offline for some time, which didn't help the supply of vaccine. And so we only have four suppliers of the vaccine were somewhat limited in the amount of vaccine that can be produced at short notice. Normally, it takes about six months to make vaccine, and so you've got really challenges at short notice to make vaccine. And the way around it has been to have a reserve supply of about six million doses to help in these large outbreaks that occur very infrequently. And in most scenarios every year, six million doses is great. But unfortunately, scenarios such as we have now where a large number of people are being infected, six million doses in reserve is not sufficient. Unfortunately, a similar thing happened in 2008 and 2009 in South America, and this occurs about every 10 years. It's not every year a problem, but these occasional problems really do stretch our abilities to control this disease. Finally, given those challenges and given the fact that we know, at least from history, that this can happen every 10 years or so, what do you think are the most promising steps we can take to avert future yellow fever epidemics? Well, the easiest one to do would be to increase the um, emergency stockpile from 6 million doses. Let's say we made it 12 million doses. The other um, feature of the vaccine is we have a minimum amount of vaccine in a dose, but there's no maximum in a dose. And so most vaccines contain a far excess, up to a thousandfold more virus than is needed to immunize you. And so if we could actually dilute out the vaccine before it was actually put into ampules, we could have no problems with making that vaccine. But that would require the changes in the requirements to manufacture the vaccine, and that would be needed to be done by the WHO. Thank you, Dr. Barrett.